delighted to uh, welcome as our opening keynote uh, somebody who has championed the indie cause for, uh, for many a year and a very strong champion he's been of that. It's uh, over to Rami. Uh, wow, that was a very brief intro. Uh, normally you get like a little breathe there while somebody's introducing you. This is like, here's Rami. Um, hi, my name is Rami Ismail. I'm uh, one half of Dutch independent studio of Lambeer. Uh, we're best known for games like Super Crate Box, uh, Luftrousers, <laughs> thank you, Ridiculous Fishing, <laughs> and Nuclear Throne. Yeah. It's like for every game I mentioned, two people in the audience shouted, yeah. <laughs> this is really exciting. We have at least eight customers in this audience. Um, I'm also the creator of a bunch of indie tools, uh, best known for Press Kit. And <laughs> See, I always, I always sort of knew that that was going to be one of my largest contributions to, to games rather than the games I make. You're like, OK, this is confirmed. Uh, and dotoolkit.com, where you can also find uh, Prescott. Not a lot of people know about this one. This one is a good one. You should write it down if you make games. And currently working on something called Game Dev World, which aims to bring uh, knowledge about game development into every major language in the world, uh, which is a huge project as well. Sometimes I write ridiculous things on my blog at ramiismail.com. I'm also on Twitter. Um, and that's kind of who I am. Is anybody very confused about that? Does anybody want like, more justification for why, why, why I can be here? No? You all good? Cheers. Um, I want to start with something I never do. Because um, normally I don't really give a damn about cinema when it comes to games. Uh, this is our medium. You know, a lot of people talk about, like, how do games compare to movies? It's like, who cares, right? Like, people ask about the citizen gain of video games, and I ask about the tetri Tetris of movies, and nobody can ever figure that one out. So why, why do we care? But uh, it can't hurt to look sideways sometimes. And um, basically, this is me pulling a citizen gain. Uh, this is a quote by uh, Orson Welles. Uh, from the book Orson Welles interviews and this was an interview. This was a, a short excerpt from an interview that uh, Orson Welles did in 1958 And he said uh, I liked cinema better before I got, began to do it now all the magic is destroyed I don't like cinema except when I'm shooting so uh, imagine me posting this tweet That would piss a lot of people off Piss a whole lot of people off. A lot of people would be really angry at this. I actually tweeted something along the lines of this a few weeks ago, and um, you didn't want to see my Twitter that day. Um, it's not that I, I, I don't like games, like I, I do like games, um, but the fact that I couldn't tweet something like this without a lot of people getting upset kind of got me thinking. Like something, something went wrong somewhere. Um, the truth is, this, this this tweet, the tweet that I did that was like this, was part of a larger series of tweets. And in those tweets, I argued that I'm a game developer and that I care more for creating games, for the creators of games, and for the creation in our medium than I care for playing games. And to be honest, I can't play games properly anymore. Like, when I play like a big, big blockbuster game, all I see is like, wow, that's really good how they loaded that texture. Or like, Ah, I'm, I saw that, I saw that, I saw what you did there. Or like a little design arc or a narrative arc, and I'm like, oh, this just happened, so this is going to happen next. And it's frustrating because I, I kind of remember what it felt like to play games, but I don't anymore. And why can't I say that? Why can't I say that without a huge storm of critique? And I've been thinking about it, and I think I figured it out. We've been pandering. We've been pandering to our customers. We've been pandering to our consumers. And it's kind of time to start treating them like adults. So my talk today is called Fuck Yeah Customers. Um, and before I continue with that, I, I do want to make some, some things clear. Like, I've made some quotes about audiences and about customers during my time uh, at Vanbeer. I've said things like this. I said, uh, your audience is your front line, which is uh, during my early days when I still talked about business as if it was war, and I only used war metaphors for that, because that's a very video game thing, apparently. Um, but it's, 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 it's true, right? Like, I, I love our audience. Everybody who, who's followed Vlambrian knows that. 
We love our audiences. We love our community. Uh, the Nuclear Throne community has been awesome. We live stream twice a week. Um, we do weekly updates. We communicate with them on forums. Um, we went as far as to give every, um, every person that ever bought Nuclear Throne a free copy at the start of the year um, because they just got too good at the game and we, we needed people that were shit at the game. Um, so we said, well, yeah, you can all just give a copy to a friend that's terrible at it, and then we'll figure it out. Um, and I said things like, um, you need your customers more than they need you, which I also believe is true. Like, if, if I disappear, most of the people that play our games will just go play somebody else's games, and they'll be fine. They'll be happy. They'll go, like, remember that one game where you, sh like, you, you caught fish, and then you flung them up into the air, and then you shoot them? That was good, right? And that's it. And they'll go play something else. Um, but if our customers disappear, then I'm in trouble because now nobody's buying our games and it will be pretty hard to keep making games like that. Now, when I say that, I realize at some point that there is sort of an implication in there that I'm not 100% comfortable with. And the implication is that you need every single one of your customers. And the truth is, I don't need this guy. Because this guy, honestly, <laughs> is kind of an asshole. So, would you, would you, so this person, this person is a customer. This person paid me $12.99 to be allowed to, to play my game. And somewhere in there is the implication that this is okay. And it's not. If, if I was sitting somewhere with a group of friends, why did I put my bag here? Uh, if I was sitting somewhere with a group of friends and a stranger came up to me and said, if I pay you $12.99, can I talk shit with you? And like call you names, is that okay? I'd be like, no, get out. What's the big idea there? And like, the dollars are taxable as well, so it's not even $12.99. But like, sure, you know, it's like, this is easy for me to say, like, right? Flamber has been doing well. Um, we're in a good spot. So for me to say, like, you don't need all of your customers is kind of a, is kind of a cheat. But I, I want to zoom out a bit on this one. I want to I think about what all of this means. So let's zoom out a bit. What is a customer? So there's, there's this, this thing that we do in the industry, and a lot of people do that, where they confuse the terms customer and consumer, and they're not the same. So now if somebody says, like, you have to treat your customers well, I tend to agree when people say you have to treat your consumers well. I don't even know what the hell that means. Because a customer is concrete. A consumer is nebulous. A consumer is literally anybody that ever spent money on any object in the world as a business transaction. Then you're a consumer. You don't have to buy video games. You're still a consumer. You can be a games consumer. That doesn't really mean anything as well, except for that you once bought a game. Um, they probably don't even want your games. They're probably not interested in your games. Like, the largest part of consumers is not, is definitely not interested in our games. Uh, our customers are. We know that for a fact. Um, so you don't really need the consumers. You need customers, maybe. And a customer is somebody who bought your game. A potential customer is somebody that might buy your game. Uh, potential customers is who we market to. When you market your game, you're not trying to convince somebody that doesn't want your game that they really want your game. You're trying to find people that would buy your game if only they knew about it and then convince them to buy your game, right? So we do an, we do an interactive entertainment. Why is this slight line down to the right? That's weird. Um, we do an interactive entertainment. So what we do is create it for an audience. Like, at the core of video games is the idea that we create something, and then somebody else sits in front of it or holds the device or interacts with it in some way, and based on their interaction, we give back a different game state, and then they respond to that. And that loop is a video game, right? We all agree about that. That's what's at the heart of a video game, is that little loop of interaction. It can be anything. It can be walking around. It can be shooting. It can be talking. It can be jumping. Um, it doesn't really matter. So we inherently need an audience. We inherently need somebody to sit down, play the game. But we also run a studio to earn money. Uh, we want to ensure that we have food. We want to ensure that we can pay rent. Hopefully, we can pay a good salary. Um, optimally, we can pay a good salary. And then we also have to manage the community. We have to make sure that it's a positive community that is uh, sharing and understanding and, uh, and positive and beautiful words like that. 
And we're also an industry that is a larger ecosystem that as a whole, to be honest, is kind of not in a great spot right now. We have, uh, we have the race to the bottom, we have discoverability issues, all the mobile companies decided that mobile is like kind of hard to deal with and discoverability hard, is hard and user acquisition is expensive. So they're all going to PC games because PC games have the future. And all the PC developers are like, well, discoverability on PC is hard. So you know what, we're going to do console games because these get get found there, and all the console developers are like, ah, console games are really expensive, we're going to make cheaper games, so we're going to go to mobile. We're all just looping in circles. I don't really know what's happening. Um, but like, it's, not, it's not going perfectly, right? We're, in, we're kind of in a tough spot. So those are four things, and for, for a strange reason, those four things feel at odd. They, they don't feel like they, they fit together really well. Um, and part of that, the, the reason why they feel at all odds is because we fucked up. We fucked up pretty bad. Uh, we've been treating, we've not been treating our audience like adults, and we've trained them to have really, really super unreasonable expectations. You don't really think about that, but uh, this is my favorite example of that. Apparently, this is how you do motion capture. Just Somebody does the performance, and then, ta-da! Like, this, is, this is literally a, a screenshot from a little video where they showed how they made Uncharted. So from that point to that point, there's nothing. There's not the people that rig the character. There's not the people that clean up the animation. There's not the people that make the character or that weigh the character or that do uh, the texturing. There's none of that. It's just magic. It's like Unity. If you have a project in, um, that runs perfectly on PC, all you have to do is press the button. It runs perfectly on PlayStation 4. It does that in every engine in the world, by the way. We had, a, we had somebody come to us and say, like, why doesn't Nuclear Throne run on PlayStation 4 yet? And we're like, well, you know, that takes a bit of work. And they're like, why don't you use Unity? <laughs> we're like, well, because we use GameMaker. They're like, why don't you import any Unity? We're like, be because we use GameMaker. Like, can't you export that? It's like, no, that doesn't work. And they were so confused by that. Because our industry has been really good at teaching people that putting a game on a console is a press of a button. You want to add a new character to your game, you just put somebody in a suit like that, and ta-da, it's a character. You know, that pencil right there just magically appeared in this screenshot. <laughs> they didn't even have to motion capture it. It's just there. It's what the camera does. It's great. You know, the problem is this industry wants to be perfect. We want to be perfect. We want to be flawless. Because it's a gamer's world. There's no obstacles, it's just challenges, right? That's bullshit. We want everything to look easy. We want everything to look doable. We've trained our audience that they can expect a clear answer to every single question. Doesn't matter what the question is. If you say, like, we don't know, you know what they tell you? They tell you that that's bad design. There's, there's something really painful there. The majority of design is admitting that you don't know. The majority of the design is sitting down and trying something and being like, I don't know if this works. Now somebody changes like a tiny value for a single gun in Call of Duty. Do you remember that? Because it was one of the largest shit shows I've seen aimed at a single human being in the pre-recent controversy era. Um, and for some reason, we're fine with that. We pander. Instead of telling people like, OK, listen. Sure, Unity will get the game to run on PlayStation 4 with a single press of a button, but then we still have the TRCs, we have the, uh, we have the uh, certification requirements, we still have to make the game work with a controller, we still have to make sure that it works on every aspect ratio. There's some performance issues. No, we can't just put it on PlayStation Vita because the PlayStation Vita isn't quite as powerful as a PC. No, Nintendo DS is also kind of hard. You know, we can't just put it there. No, no did you notice that it has two screens? <laughs> yeah, Unity doesn't just fix that. Um, no, we can't, we can't put it on VR just yet. No, it's a 2D pixel game. We haven't thought that through. <laughs> um, but everybody says, like, yeah, we'll, we'll look into it. So here's the thing. We are developers, not gamers, OK? We gave up gamer when we became a creator. We're a creator now. We can be proud of that. It doesn't mean we hate video games. Nobody says, like, that there's not some sort of unwritten law that unless you call yourself a gamer, you can't love video games, right? When Orson Welles said, 
I don't really like cinema, unless when I'm shooting it. Nobody went like, hey, hey, you should, you should be a movier. You should, you should always say you love movies. Orson Welles spent most of his time talking shit about other movies. He didn't like other movies, that's why he made movies. He liked one or two movies. That's the movies he was inspired by, and then he just made his own stuff. But for some reason we want to desperately claim to the identity of gamer. We can love games and not be gamers. We can just be developers. And our attitude doesn't have to be like wild, aggressive enthusiasm for everything that happens. When, when, somebody tell, when somebody comes to me and says like, have you heard this thing that's awesome? I can be critical. I earn my money in this business. Somebody comes to me and goes like, have you heard that Game Maker now runs on Platform X? I just be like, yeah. I, I'd like to try that first. I'd like, to, I'd like to see about that. Have you heard about this thing? Yeah, uh, I don't know. I haven't really figured it out yet. Let, let me look into it. Um, we're developers. You know what defines a developer? You make games. That's it, period. If you're a game developer and you hate video games, that's fine. There are developers that despise games. Like, uh, sadly, no longer like a studio, Tale of Tales. They hated games. They made some of the most inspiring games I've played. So we can treat our audience like adults. Uh, quite a number of them are adult or at least mature human beings. Some kids are actually really mature human beings. They just kind of tend to lay low. Large part of that is because we allow a lot of assholes into our community, uh, like the guy at, at the start of my presentation. And part of that is because we're scared to piss off customers. And yes, it's true. Every response counts, right? Um, if, you, if you give a response and it's not the right response according to somebody, they will, might put it on Reddit or they might put it on Twitter, or they can get uh, really, really angry at you, and they can write a really angry email. They can send spam to your forums. They can sign you up for all sorts of weird mailing lists. Uh, they can harass you for the next few months of your life. Um, every time you interact with somebody, there's a potential chance to mess up, right? Um, it also worked, that also works the other way, by the way. Every time you oversimplify something to your consumer, to your customer, you're teaching them that it works that way, and you make everything just a tiny little bit harder for every other game developer in the world. So if somebody asks you a question whether it's easy, then think about it for a second. Like, no, actually it's not. It just seems easy to us because we've been doing this for all of our life, but it might actually be hard. More importantly, the customer is not always right. Nor are you, but like, the customer isn't always right. If the customer was always right, I wouldn't have a job. You wouldn't have a job. Doctors wouldn't have a job. Nobody would have a job because the customer's always right. If they knew so well, then what's, what's the point of our job? The point of our job is that we make stuff and we don't know whether it's right. That's the whole point of being creative. No idea. You just start at A and you go to question mark and hopefully it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. If, if the customer is always right, every game that releases right now would be a zombie survival Minecraft MMO with spaceships, with colors, because colors are hip again, right? But that didn't happen because the customers wanted that. That happened because the games industry at some point went like, you're kind of done with brown. How about colors? <laughs> that could be cool. We've done gray. Gray was cool. We've done weird green. How about just colors? And everything is colors. It's not as if the customers just went like, hey, we want colors. Customers were like, we want more realism. And they went like, sure, we'll give you more realism. Here's a lot of colors. And nobody went like, that's not real. And I'm like, oh, cool, colors. So the point is that a customer is usually not a game developer. Some of them are. Like, there's a lot of customers that also make games or that tinker with games if they have used Game Maker. Um, they're customers. Part of our job is to figure out what, what they want or not give a shit about what they want and then find customers for that, right? Doesn't always mean that creators are right, though. So as, as an opposite thought for that, uh, please learn to listen. Like, that doesn't mean please learn to accept everything that people say. But, you know, every now and then a customer comes along and says something really, really fucking smart. And then you listen. And every now and then they give you criticism for something you haven't thought through, and then you listen to them. And in some cases, it might even be smart to say sorry which sounds really weird in the current day and age because apparently sorry is now an, a capital offense uh, to say, but saying sorry is perfectly fine. 
We messed up a few times. We messed up with lift trousers. We had a thematic that a lot of people found upsetting. We didn't really agree with that interpretation, but the point is they had that interpretation. So we said sorry, because my job as a developer is to create something that people interpret in a certain way, hopefully, to communicate an idea. Apparently, we fucked up, so we said sorry. So with that whole thing of like every single consumer can mess up everything comes a, comes a weird thing, because every single consumer suddenly becomes worth a lot. And the truth is, they're not worth that much. Uh, the thing is, when we started, when we started Nuclear Throne, uh, we, did it, we did early access, right? And part of early access is getting feedback. And part of feedback is having a constructive community. So what we decided to do was kind of a weird idea. We said, OK, while the game is in early access, it's going to be more expensive. And when we release, we're going to lower the price. We don't, we, haven't, we don't say by how much, but we'll lower the price when we release the game. So we're going to sell less. Right? We're going to sell less because we're going to convince less people to spend money on this game because a lot of people are just going to wait for the final release. And that's exactly fine for us. Because we didn't want a lot of users. We wanted a bunch of users that really cared. We wanted a bunch of customers that would go, play the game, give us feedback. We wanted customers that, despite knowing that they can get the game for a bit cheaper, they just wait a few months, they still buy it now. Those were the customers we wanted. And then at some point, we realized that those customers also have a downside, which is that they're all very excited. So they play a lot. And because they played a lot, they got really, really good. So by the end of the second year of development, we had no idea if the game was accessible to a new player. We just didn't know. Because all the feedback we were getting was, well, if you beat the game four times in a row, you know, the difficulty keeps scaling up, but it's a bit too easy at that point. And I, I, I can't even get that far. And we were fixing stuff there all the time because people were only giving us feedback about that until at some point we went like, do you think that maybe just you know, our community is too good? We need more people. And then we thought, we can do a discount. But that will upset the people that we've already given the game an early access, saying that the game would be more expensive until after it releases. So what do we do? And eventually we came up with the idea, we'll give every single person that bought the game a free copy to give to a friend. We'll get a bunch of people that are vouched for by a community of people that really care about the game. They're going to start on the game. The game is really hard, so they're going to be terrible. And then we get a bunch of feedback about which parts are the worst, and we can fix it. And if you notice the story I just told you, every customer in that story has a value, but every customer in that story also has a cost. We don't really talk about that. Customers earn you money. They can earn you community. They can earn you uh, marketing. But they also cost stuff. They can cost you community. They can cost you marketing. They can even cost you money. Uh, they can cost you uh, through support. Uh, when we brought Ridiculous Fishing uh, to Android, which I have an Android phone. I'll prefix it with that. Um, it didn't do super well. But what it also did was it blew up my mail account by about 150 emails a week of people complaining that it doesn't work on that one weird Android phone with a diagonal screen. Because apparently, there's a fucking Android phone with a diagonal screen. I didn't know that. And it turns out that Ridiculous Fishing, which is designed for a vertical screen, does not actually work on a diagonal screen. Um, and I had to explain that to somebody. Um, and they also have an impact on the industry. The more we teach people to wait for sales, the less money you know, a game can make from that specific customer. It's not always the best option to maximize, is what I'm trying to say. It's not always the best option to get as many customers as possible. So uh, to prove that, and because I strongly believe that uh, the best way to communicate an idea like this is by making up graphs. I made up some graphs. Um, this is kind of how I think of customers. It's like, the more knowledge they have of the game, the more useful they are to your community. If they don't buy your game, they don't really have monetary value to you. Um, but if they do buy the game, they, they do have monetary value. Um, a human is always a human being, so they have value because they're a human. Um, and then if they're just a consumer, they get a little bit more value. And if they're a customer, they get a, they get a lot of value. And if they're a fan, they get a huge amount of value. Uh, but then there's a multiplier. Uh, if they're constructive people, there's, there's a multiplier of about one. 
So in neutral, that doesn't change. That's not time zero. That's just no change. In a destructive, you just multiply it by minus one, and it's a negative value. It doesn't matter. If you have a very knowledgeable person in your, in your community that is really, really active and engaged with everybody, but they're also an asshole, you can figure out how that sum works out, right? Now, as I pointed out, every customer is a human being, so please treat them as a human being. Like, yes, we are a studio. Yes, we're trying to earn money. Every now and then, it can be really good to just fucking forget about that. Every now and then, you get an email, and it's just somebody with a heartbreaking story, or just somebody that is out of money, or somebody that lives in a country where making money is a lot harder, or whatever, just send them a key. You're a human being. You can empathize. Like, we hopefully all have the ability to at least uh, empathize with other human beings. Um, that can, make somebody, that can make somebody's day. It can make somebody's week. Uh, we've had stories where people s send us heartbreaking requests where we got an email back a year later with another heartbreaking story. And at that point, it's just good to remember that you're a human too and that you don't always have to be a business. Now, whatever you do, this is kind of an important thing. This is so important that I wrote it a lot of times in the hope that it would communicate better. Um, there's a few rules for communications. If you have bad news, you're already too late in communicating it. You want to communicate bad news as soon as possible and as clear as possible. Sure, there's minor exceptions there when there is a lot of bad news. Maybe don't, don't add to it immediately. But like, you want to be as clear, as fast, and as honest as possible. When we did Luftrausers, we announced an original release date for spring 2013, 12. Shit. Spring 2012. It eventually released in 2014. It took us two years. The majority of that was our fault. Part of it was Sony's fault. Part of it was the fault of us not talking well with Sony. Um, because it turns out that if you've never done certification before, uh, console certification is really, really hard and unexpectedly confusing. Um, and instead of being like, yeah, you know, there's, there's issues, there's delays, we just went to, to the people that were waiting for the game. We said, listen, we fucked up. We thought this was going to be really easy because somebody told us we just pressed the button in Unity. And um, it turns out not to work that way. It turns out it's quite a bit harder to put a game on console. Um, and then people waited. That was it. They asked every now and then very polite questions. We'd get some upset people that were like, Hey, you promised this game in 2012, and we'd just be like, yeah, we wrote a blog post about it, explaining it. Like, oh, OK, cool, I'll wait for it. And some people left, and that was fine as well. Um, but if you don't communicate bad news, things can go horribly wrong. We've done that as well, where we just kind of shut up about things, and then people emailed us, and they're like, hey, listen, have you noticed that one trophy bug that you have? We're like, let's shut up about this one. And then things exploded, and people got really, really upset. Because it can't really be that customers know a game better than the developer. Sure, sometimes it happens, and then you listen. But if you just ignore it, stuff blows up, because it bubbles under the surface. It might go away for now, but it will come back. Good news, communicate however you want. I don't care. Communicate it, don't communicate it. Celebrate it, don't celebrate it. Um, we like celebrating Flambeer's victories with the customers that made it possible. We like doing that. So when Nuclear Throne broke a million dollar revenue, we put it out on the internet. Why? Because we felt that was partly our, partly our job and partly the community's job. They helped us reach that. And communicate uncertainty. Such a huge part of Nuclear Throne's development for us has been to learn to explain to people that we don't know. When is Nuclear Throne going to be done? We don't know. How many characters are you going to have? We don't know. How many weapons? We don't know. Do you have any idea about the game? Actually, no. <laughs> we have no idea. It's a procedurally generated roguelike that has been in development for two years. We have an idea of where we want to go. How do we get there? We don't know. And it started when we started early on in Nuclear Thrones development. We got the usual responses. Well, how can't you know? You're the developers. You should know. This is bad game design. These guys don't know what they're doing. Yeah? We just wrote back, yeah, we don't. That's, that's our job, is to not know and then figure out stuff, and then eventually we do know. And every single forum post that we wrote was 
paragraphs of explanation, trying to explain to people, listen, this is, this is, our, this is our perspective here. Like, we understand that's not your perspective, because you just paid for a game and you expect it to work. We're in early access. The option menu doesn't work. It's broken. All the sliders are there, but they're actually not functional. Yes, we'll put a not functional thing on there. Yeah, but no, we won't make it work yet. Why not? Because that takes a lot of work. We can't just put like an SFX slider, music slider, scaling options, resolutions options, all that in there and just expect it to work in like four days of development time. We want to make sure that we get all of our, all of our options right and then we'll, then we'll ship it. Like when will that happen? We don't know. Why don't you know? Because we're working on this game and we're just fixing things as we see them. Like when will you work on the menu? Well, eventually. Before release, yes, before release. <laughs> We've had this conversation and every time we'd respond with as much, as much perspective as possible. Try to explain it to them. And you know what happened? What happened was now we don't have to do that. Because when somebody asks us something, one of the people that has been in our community for a long time will just jump in. You're like, oh yeah, no, but you know, if Lambry is focusing on this and that, and because they're doing iterative development, they don't really know when they're going to do that. And I'm like, whoa, are you the same person that gave a shit in the first week for not updating a sprite? <laughs> and yes. They are, because all you needed to do is just explain it to them. Now, am I very happy with the, the culture of starting as an asshole and then becoming a likable person? No, not really, but like, given my options, I'll take it. Uh, I'd like to eventually structurally change the industry to not have that as a default. And part of that is responding to requests like that politely and with a lot of information and perspective as a developer, not as a gamer. I actually still mess up a bunch of that, to be honest. Um, I, I made a few rules for myself. If I ever want to give a one sentence reply to something, I stop, I remove that, and I start over so that it's not a one sentence reply. It turns out to help a lot uh, because I think like a game developer, which means that I use a tremendous amount of jargon um, and that doesn't always communicate well. Um, Whenever I feel really snarky, I just shut down my computer. Um, I don't drink, but if you're ever drunk, please shut down your computer. Uh, I've seen projects crash and burn uh, because of that. Um, and also, if you see something out of tune with your community, out of tone, something that doesn't feel right in your community, just take it down. Yes, they'll shout freedom of speech. That's cool, I can still talk. Just do it somewhere else. This is your platform. This is your platform. You literally, this is your place. If you want to give people all the freedom to talk about anything they want, it's your platform. If you want to only allow constructive posts, that's your platform. If you want to only allow posts that mention the title of the game four times in the message body, it's your platform. If you want to delete any message that doesn't start with the letter M, it's your platform. That's freedom of speech. That's also freedom of speech. So you don't have to just allow everything because freedom of speech on the internet. That's not how freedom of speech works. We all know this. It's good to have this repeated every now and then. Remember, remember I recently did um, something called hot pepper gaming. They do an interview with you after you eat a very hot habanero pepper. It was a very poor idea. Don't do that. <laughs> um, and then the presenter actually asked me for the release date for Nuclear Throne before they would give me milk uh, to <laughs> stop the fire. And uh, I thought, I'll just, I'll just be clever. I'll use the official answer, which is we're tracking for September, uh, which means that we have our eyes set but are not actually 100% sure about September, and it will probably slip for October or January or something. Um, but since I said the word September, uh, every headline uh, written about that video includes the word September and uh, release. And I thought I was being clever by using a very specific phrase, and then I realized that that very specific phrase is only known by people that have done console launches before. So to the majority of the world, it just means like, yeah, we're releasing in September. Um, so think about your jargon as well when you communicate. Um, but more importantly, I think you have to figure out that you, you stand for something. If you are a developer, you have a brand, your brand stands for something. If your brand stands for something, it can attract like-minded people, right? So Flamber games are made by Flamber. Period. So why are we doing early access? Because we like feedback. Does that mean we'll listen to our community? Hell no. Not at all. We actually tell people that. When they come to us and they said, like, hey, 
we gave you a bunch of feedback, why didn't you use it? We're like, because we thought it wasn't good feedback. Like, it was lovely that you wrote all of that, and we appreciate the time you took, but it doesn't fit with our vision of the game. Thanks, though. Uh, please keep doing that. And the people are fine. Like, we, we, didn't, we didn't do it. No, we didn't implement your super powerful weapon that uses no ammo that shoots disco balls. Sounds cool on paper, but it's not the game we want to make. And no, we didn't nerf that one weapon that you think is too powerful but everybody else has trouble with. And no, we didn't buff that one weapon you like. No, we didn't add your character idea. And we say that. We don't care. Their feedback is feedback. We filter through it. That's our job. We don't have to listen. And Flamber games are worth their price. We don't do discounts. We almost never do discounts. Ridiculous Fishing, I can proudly say, it's one of the few iOS games that has never been discounted. I'm proud of that. Nuclear Throne, never been in a Steam sale. We get a lot of people asking us, why wasn't Nuclear Throne in the Summer Steam sale? We're like, well, because it wasn't. We don't put our game in the Summer Steam sale. They're like, when is it going to be on sale? We're like, it's not. It's probably not going to be. And if it's going to be, it's going to be months after release. When's release? In a few months. So I have to wait a year to get this game. Yes. I'll buy it now. Good. <laughs> We've had that conversation a million times. Because you just got to be fair. Like, just got to be honest. This is the way it works. This is why we do it that way. Here's your choice. Now, what I'm trying to say in very many words is that customers are really, really, really important. I'm trying to say, celebrate your customers. Every customer you have that is a good customer, celebrate them. But you don't have to be a slave to them. You don't owe them anything. The contract with the customer is really simple. They give you X amount of money, you give the good that they expect in return to it. That's it. It's nothing more. If they give me $12.99, you know what they get? They get Nuclear Throne. Do they get the right to post on my forum? No. I can take that away. I never promised that they had the right to post on my forum. Do they have a right to my time to respond to an email? No. Do I have to listen to them being assholes to the rest of the community? Absolutely not. Do I have to take into account their feedback? No. Is, a valid, is, is it a valid complaint if somebody tells you on Twitter, well, I won't buy your game because of your opinions? Don't. Buy somebody else's game. Like, that's not worth $12.99. And people forget that. When somebody says customer, when somebody says consumer, we always think like everybody. One person. Multiply that by the value of your game. That's the sale you lost. Is that worth whatever they're asking of you? The answer is very often no. And the people that buy your game that are constructive members of your community, that want to help you out, that send good feedback, that try to help other people out, celebrate them. Reach out to them. Say thank you. When we had a guy that did, we have a guy that almost did 400 YouTube videos on Nuclear Throne. He, would, he, he has a very, he has a, um, he's a Northern English um, accent. Uh, and he, he would say something like, no, no. And we thought that was good. So that's now one of the loading tips in the game. It's just a little wink at that person that was super nice to us. And we just do that. He renamed some of our enemies by accident. We called them toxic frogs. He called them ball guys. So now they're called ball guys, because why not? Um, but the, po the point that I'm trying to, to make is that you don't have to just accept customers. Every, every part of our job is to not accept things the way they are, but to make decisions to make informed decisions, to think about things, to think about things outside of the box, to think laterally. And we don't do that with our customers. We don't do that with customers ever. We just accept that they're our customers, and this is just the way it's going to be. And yes, they paid us money, so yes, they have a right to be in our forum. Yes, they have a right to talk shit. They don't. This quote, this I don't accept, I got that from, uh, from Don Daclo, who once gave a presentation when I was a wee student and I had no idea what the hell I was doing, which I honestly still don't. Um, but I always thought that only applied to video games. And it really doesn't. It applies to pretty much anything related to business or design. So really, if I want to summarize this talk into one phrase, you don't have to accept something from a consumer just because they might give you money. Thank you.